On an alien planet and behind enemy lines, the Animorphs morph bat and start flying towards the Andalite forces. Axe figures the only Andalite they can really trust at this point is the commander, who has serious personal stakes against the Yerks. However, they end up getting caught in the middle of the battle, and the Animorphs are horrified to witness the entirety of the Andalite forces retreat and take off back into space. And then to make matters worse, Tobias has mysteriously disappeared. Axe is heartbroken by his people losing the war, but seeing more Yerk ships descend onto the land, he quickly realizes the Andalites' true plans, and tells the remaining Animorphs to head for the ocean, but doesn't tell them why in case the Yerks capture them and extract the information from them. They make it to the coast, but now Rachel has also disappeared. Panicked, the four remaining Animorphs enter the ocean and morph Hammerhead Shark. Hey, if it's good enough for the Yerks, it should be good enough for the Animorphs, right? The underwater world of the Libran planet is a sight to behold, full of colorful alien fish feeding off the geothermal energy from the Earth. It's nature, but without all the icky predators and natural selection and stuff. Cassie feels right at home, of course. However, this sight is quickly tarnished by the arrival of four Liren controllers on water jets, who identify the Animorphs and start shooting Liren spear guns. However, these things are designed to kill the fish in this ocean, which all seem to be made of memory foam, so the spears are no more effective than high-velocity paper clips. Axe quickly learns that the Yerks are located in the rear lobes of the Liren brain, which is pretty easy to bite off. Soon, all the Lirans are free from the Yerk control, and missing half of their brains, but they say they'll regrow them. Man, Lirans can regrow brains, taxons regrow legs, hork have Wolverine-style healing abilities. The universe is made of sturdier stuff than you and I. The Lirans tell them how to get to the Liran city, but there are a lot of Liran controllers between here and there, so the free Lirans agree to let the Animorphs acquire them to evade detection. The Animorphs reach the surface of the water and demorph. We lay there treading water, rising and falling on the gentle Liran swells. The Liran sun was still low on the horizon, coming up on another day. It turned the water golden around us. I reached and pressed my hand against the Liran slimy yellow flesh. When sky meets sea, and light human and Liran are joined as allies, my Liran said, each with our weaknesses, each with our strengths. It moved me somehow, as ludicrous as it might have looked to an outsider. Humans and an Andalite wallowing clumsily beside big, yellow, psychic frogs, as Marco called them. Three species on a world conquered by the Yerks. We probably would have seemed pathetic to any Yerk who happened to see us. A fellow Andalite told me we were weak because we are not united. We do not speak with one voice, I said. But this union does not feel weak. Free people who get together to defend freedom are never weak. It was Marco who said that. Maybe you can see why, despite all their strangeness, I like humans. And I am starting to like the Lirans. The Animorphs morph Lirans and make their way to the underwater city. And before anyone brings it up in the comments, Gungan 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 Jar Jar Binks. We got that out of our system? Good, then let's move on. They reach the city without conflict and are quickly ushered inside, where they meet the Andalite commander. It's now we finally learn the Andalites' real plan, the plan Axe had suspected. The Andalites plan to retreat from the land battle since day one, to lure the Yerks into a false sense of security. The continent is basically rigged to explode when the majority of the Yerks have landed. However, the Andalites didn't have enough time to finish setting up the big continent-exploding bomb, thanks to the Andalites' captain's betrayal, forcing the Andalites to retreat earlier than planned. The bombs will need to be set off manually, and the Animorphs have just the morphs to get to the main switch. The Animorphs agree, but soon Marco vanishes into thin air. The Andalites theorize that the Animorphs' masses are being snapped back into Z-space one by one. Best case scenario is that their consciousnesses are re-entering the mosquito bodies, but there's still a chance of that not happening and the Animorphs suffocating in Z-space. Since the snapbacks are occurring faster and faster, this puts an uncertain timer on just how long the Animorphs have to reach the main switch, which really amps up the tension by about a hundred. Well done! The three remaining Animorphs remorph hammerhead sharks and haul ass as fast as they can to the main switch, which is hidden in something called a bright hole, which makes me think of Neil Hamburger running around with the nuclear football. 
The Animorphs reach the entrance of the Bright Hole, but are spotted by a mind-reading Liren controller, who sets off the alarm before the Animorphs manage to bite half his head off. The Yerks now aware of their presence, the Animorphs swim into the hole, but Cassie soon vanishes. There's a theory floating around that the Animorphs are getting snapped back in the order of their mass. Tobias was a hawk, thus the lightest, and got snapped back first. Rachel had a model's body, and Marco is short. Considering where Cassie fits in with his order, we can safely come to a solid conclusion about Jake. He's a chubby chaser. Jake and Axe make it through the cave, but Jake gets snapped back just as they reach the switch. Axe manages to punch in the code just as a small army of controllers finish digging a tunnel into the cave from the surface. Such as it is with fiction, Axe manages to get snatched back just in the nick of time before getting killed by either the Yerks or the bombs, and finds himself back in the Mosquito Body, a split second after they had entered Z-Space, effectively meaning that they are all now in two places at once, one set of Animorphs having adventures on Lirin, while another set just barely escaping getting swatted by the now-awakened Aldershot. Oh yeah, apparently the cure for comas are Mosquito Bites. Kind of a bullshit final moment for such a great book. Still, this book it was such a great example of how to do continuity right within the series, and with this under K.A.'s belt, I'm sure we'll see more books as tightly wound within the overall narrative. Well, I mean, unless, of course, she passes Animorphs off to a bunch of ghost writers who aren't as familiar with the characters and plots, and some of which will do no research at all. But seriously, what are the chances of that happening? Post-book follow-up. When it comes to Animorphs, I personally prefer the smaller Earth-based books where the Animorphs have to use their limited resources and clever ways to outsmart and sabotage the Yerks over the bigger, more fantastical books, the ones that throw the Animorphs into over-the-top situations like time travel or going to another planet and stuff. I simply relate more to desperate guerrilla fighters than I do star-hopping, quantum-leaping space warriors. This book, however, manages to find a happy medium ground. The Animorphs all end up in a fantastical situation, but their abilities aren't beefed up to superhero levels to compensate. They spend most of the book running their asses off, and any time they take the offensive, it's through surprise. They get the jump on the Andalite Captain, they sneak into the underwater cave. Despite the situation, these Animorphs feel like the same ones who morphed a cat to sneak into a house, instead of the ones who killed a flying orb robot with a pebble. There are some strong themes throughout the book, the most prominent being... I don't know if I want to call it a racial theme or a prejudice theme or whatever, because we humans don't really have any other intelligent species to interact with. Actually, I think the theme is more about adaption that one must be able to adapt to other people in order to overcome conflict. The biggest flaw for the Andalites is that, thanks in part to their troubled past, they are incapable of accepting the help and advantages of other races, and that's really hurting them. Hell, the reason the Yerks are so powerful is that, in their own twisted way, they do adapt easily to other species and are capable of integrating the advantages of each of those species for their own cause. A few times in the book, Axe actually complements the human's ability to adapt to certain situations. And of course we have the cheesy but powerful acquiring the Liren scene, in which three races come together to accomplish one goal. And accomplish it they do. This is a great book, and if it wasn't for a few moments of stretched credibility at the beginning and end, I'd give it a perfect score. As it stands, I give Animorphs number 18 the decision a 9 out of 10. We're entering an interesting point in the series. The next book in the main series, number 19, The Departure, is considered by fans to be the Citizen Kane of Cassie books, and that's followed by the infamous David trilogy, which many fans consider to be the moment the series reached its ultimate peak. I'll wait till I get to those reviews before I give my opinions, but before we can get into them, there's an itch I've been wanting to scratch since I started this project. This review coming up is going to be big perhaps even bigger than my Andalite Chronicles review. But I need to get these thoughts and feelings off my chest before I can continue with the opinionated guide. We've reached Megamorphs number two in the time of the dinosaurs. And I say with absolute certainty that this is the one Animorphs book I genuinely hate. God help us all.